Welcome to the lecture on Bartleby the Scrivener by Herman Melville. In our class, we've defined the period of Romanticism as largely existing from 1789 to 1865. We've also discussed how start and end dates are at times debated among scholars. In part, that's because aesthetic trends have a center point of strength and end periods in which new ideas define American writing. The center point of Romanticism is with authors such as Nathaniel Hawthorne and Edgar Allan Poe, both of whom are writing some of their best-known works in the 1830s. The story that we'll look at in this lecture, Bartleby the Scrivener, comes towards the end of the period of Romanticism. I'd place this story as late Romanticism, and it functions in ways as a transitional text in which we can see some elements of Romanticism fall away and begin to give rise to new ideas. Perhaps to point out the obvious, this is generally why scholars sometimes debate the start and end points of aesthetic trends, because new writing begins to pivot away from old ideas, slowly coalescing around new concepts. In Bartleby, we can see that transitionary process in action. One of the first concepts we see fall away is the setting. This story is published in 1853. It comes out in two parts as a longer story in Putnam's Monthly Magazine in their November and December issues. Up until this point in our class, we've seen fiction that explores the American past, such as Rip Van Winkle and Young Goodman Brown, and we've seen fiction set overseas. But we haven't seen a lot of fiction set in contemporary American locations. By that I mean in a setting that the author and some readers would have recognized from their own lives. Here the author Herman Melville sets the story published in 1853 in the late 1840s in New York City. We know a rough date for the setting based on the office that the lawyer holds. This story is set only a few years before it was published, which is a radical shift from the strategy to place stories in the past or outside of America, which was engaged by some previous American authors. And so what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that by 1853, America had very few people who were both born in America and remembered a time in which the land was a colony of the British Empire. Most everyone who lived in America in 1853, either one, was born in the country after it had earned its independence, or two, had chosen to immigrate to America for financial benefit or personal freedoms. In a world like this, where the majority of American citizens had always been American citizens, the reading public was starting to become more interested in exploring the country that they had known all their lives. Authors were responding by beginning to create a national literature that was more interested in current social issues and politics and contemporary settings. Moreover, fiction was shifting to the types of environments with which most Americans were familiar. There was a decrease in nature as the domain of narrative and an increase in the urban city or the rural town as the center point of fictional settings. In Bartleby, the story is set mostly in downtown New York. And where here is nature in this world? If you look out the lawyer's window, what are you likely to see? Well, a brick wall or another building. As I think about the story, the only place I remember elements of nature being explored is at the end in jail, the jail which is called the Tomes. Once Bartleby is in the Tomes, he finds a stretch of grass and a tree. In this story, I guess you need to be arrested to even find a little greenery. But aside from that, this story is mostly devoid of nature. Nature isn't where the compelling events of fiction happen. Those events now happen here in the city. By focusing on a contemporary American setting, roughly 70 years after the time of Rip Van Winkle, the narrative is asking us as readers to explore some specific questions, such as, how has America changed since the time of the Revolution? Is it a better place or a worse place? And how do most people spend the majority of their time? now that population centers have moved more fully to dense urban areas. Along with the change in setting, there are other aesthetic movements as well. This story isn't so much interested in the life of wealthy characters. In this story, we see the middle upper class, such as the lawyer, the lower middle class, such as Nippers, and the poor, as represented by Ginger Knight and his family. 
Likewise, the author Herman Melville in this story creates a stronger social network for his characters, whereas earlier authors, such as Poe and Hawthorne, were more interested in solitary individuals who had unique experiences. Melville in this story is better focused on how Bartleby fits or doesn't fit into a social group. This is one of the flinty rubs in the story. Bartleby is very much an older type of character, solitary, self-directed, deeply emotional, who has been forced into a more social world focused on group work directed toward business gain. But we'll come back to that idea toward the end of this lecture. For now, let's just say that though there are many romantic elements in this story, we can also see a few areas, mostly with setting and character representation, that are pivoting away from core romantic themes. For this story, I want to start with some character basics. We have four or maybe five main characters if you want to count Ginger Nut. First, we have our unnamed narrator. Let's look at a section about him. I am a man who, from his youth upwards, has been filled with a profound conviction that the easiest way of life is the best. Hence, though I belong to a profession proverbially energetic and nervous, even to turbulence at times, yet nothing of that sort have I ever suffered to invade my peace. I am one of those unambitious lawyers, who never addresses a jury, or in any way draws down public applause, but in the cool tranquility of a snug retreat, do a snug business among rich men's bonds and mortgages and title deeds. All who know me consider me an eminently safe man. The late John Jacob Astor, a personage little given to poetic enthusiasm, had no hesitation in pronouncing my first grand point to be prudence, my next method. Some time prior to the period at which this little history begins, my avocations had been largely increased. The good old office, now extinct in the state of New York, of a master in chancery, had been conferred upon me. It was not a very arduous office, but very pleasantly remunerative. I seldom lose my temper much more seldom indulge in dangerous indignation at wrongs and outrages, but I must be permitted to be rash here and declare that I consider the sudden and violent abrogation of the office of Master in Chancery by the new Constitution as a premature act, inasmuch as I had counted upon a life lease of the profits, whereas I only received those of a few short years. But this is by the way. The lawyer in this story avoids conflict, so much so he's arranged his business, so that he primarily sits in his office and works on contracts, rather than having to argue cases down at the courthouse. He's middle upper class, he's religious, and often refers to New Testament morality to explain his actions. For example, he believes that he should treat his neighbor in the same way that he would like to be treated, which is one explanation he has for why he takes an interest in Bartleby. Like most of the characters in this story, he believes that the system of business in New York is an extension of a natural order. It is likely the only social hierarchy that he's ever known, and believes that, in this system, people rise to the level that they are able. For example, he's gone to school to be a lawyer, and has the financial risk of running the business, therefore he deserves to make most of the money. Turkey, on the other hand, is only a scrivener, without much formal education and has no risk in the venture whatsoever, therefore he deserves to make substantially less. That basically is the underlying sense of fairness, as the lawyer sees it, in the American system of capitalism. Next, let's take a look at Turkey. At one point, the lawyer explains that he and Turkey are about the same age, which is roughly 60. As a side point, when you're young, you tend to average up your age, and so if you say you are pretty much 20 years old, that means that you're likely 18 or 19. The opposite is true as people get older. No one who's 57 or 58 says they're pretty much 60. However, if you're like 62 or 63, you might say that you're roughly 60 years old. So in saying that the lawyer and Turkey are the same age and roughly 60 years old, that means that most likely they're a little bit older than 60. They're 62 or 63. Anyway, here is a section in which the lawyer is talking about Turkey. Whereas with respect to Turkey, I had much ado to keep him from being a reproach to me. His clothes were apt to look oily and smell of eating houses. 
he wore his pantaloons very loose and baggy in summer, his coats were execrable, his hat not to be handled. But while the hat was a thing of indifference to me, inasmuch as his natural civility and deference, as a dependent Englishman, always led him to doff it the moment he entered the room, yet his coat was another matter. Concerning his coats I reasoned with him, but with no effect. The truth was, I suppose, that a man of so small an income could not afford to sport such a lustrous face and a lustrous coat at one and the same time. As Nippers once observed, Turkey's money went chiefly for red ink. One winter day I presented Turkey with a highly respectable-looking coat of my own, a padded gray coat of a most comfortable warmth, and which buttoned straight up from the knee to the neck. I thought Turkey would appreciate the favor and abate his rashness and obstreperousness of afternoons. But no, I verily believe that buttoning himself up in so downy and blanket-like a coat had a pernicious effect upon him, upon the same principle that too much oats are bad for horses. In fact, precisely as a rash, restive horse is said to feel his oats, so Turkey felt his coat. It made him insolent. He was a man whom prosperity harmed. This is the only profession that Turkey's ever known. He's the human Xerox machine. So since he started working, probably around the age of 15 until the present, he's been copying law documents. He works for a piecemeal wage, which is whatever the going rate is in New York in the 1840s. The lawyer is upset that Turkey won't dress better to give his office a higher level of visual respectability. But the problem here is that Turkey doesn't make enough money to buy food, pay basic rent, and afford nicer clothes, nor will he ever be able to afford these things on a scrivener's salary. Turkey is clearly upset at the lawyer's gesture to give him a coat because he's working full-time. In short, he doesn't want to accept charity. The lawyer, I think, misreads Turkey's motivation here. He misreads Turkey's motivation elsewhere, too. And in this, we begin to arrive at one of the larger themes of the story. This story wants to examine the popular identity of America set against Melville's more realistic vision of the expanding American city. In the mid-1800s, America was seen as a place of opportunity. America, to encourage immigration, would present itself overseas in magazines as one, a place of wide open spaces, and two, a place where people who focused on work could rise in terms of class and wealth standing. The story wants to take issue with both of these conceits. In this story, is America the land of wide open spaces? Well, somewhere in America, there are certainly lovely wide open spaces. But if you're a new immigrant, you'll likely be nowhere near them. You're likely living in a city as you're dependent on wages from a business that someone else owns. So you're rarely going to see those wide open spaces at all. In this story, is America the land of opportunity for those that work hard? During this period, America welcomed a large number of immigrants from Europe, particularly Ireland and Germany. Wages in America were higher than those of many European locations, but wage work in America had a ceiling. The larger question is, what opportunities existed for people in the bottom half of the economic strata to get ahead? Well, today, if you want to get ahead, maybe you can go to college for a specialized training. College certainly existed in the 1840s, but only if you could pay for it. There were no government grants or loans. Most anyone could go to any college they wanted to if they could afford full tuition. And some scholarship students could attend if they earned a scholarship and typically paid the other half of the tuition, as scholarships didn't cover the whole cost. Today, you can get ahead, perhaps, by starting your own business. If you want to start a small business today with a strong idea, you might be able to find some type of government-backed financing to start this new business. But back in the 1840s, nothing like this existed. In general, to get ahead in the 1840s, you, or more likely your family, needed to have money, either to start a business or to afford advanced training. What possibility do Turkey, Nippers, or Bartleby have of succeeding in this type of system? Probably none. Ginger Nut, by far the youngest person in the office, is essentially the intern. He goes out and buys snacks and brings them back for others to eat. 
His father, a new emigrant, works a push cart. That is, he has a cart that he pushes through neighborhoods off of which he sells things. He could sell anything, I suppose, candles or pans or bottles or maybe food. His father has engaged him at the lawyer's office as a type of job training so that he'll be able to have a better position when he's older. But how much training exactly is Gingernut receiving? He'll certainly have a better job than the push card, but will he be a lawyer or a manager? He might be something much closer to a Scrivener. A Scrivener is essentially the human Xerox machine. In this office, the lawyer writes a master contract for which he needs multiple copies. Mr. Jones sells a piece of property to Mr. Smith at this location for this much money on such and such a date. The buyer and seller each need a copy. There's probably a couple of government offices that need copies, and the law office likely needs one as well. So the Scrivener takes the master contract and makes, let's say, four copies. When he's done, together the office reads them aloud, checking for air. Then the Scrivener gets another master contract, again a real estate contract with similar boilerplate language. This time Mr. Johnson sells a piece of property to Mr. Miller at a slightly different location for a slightly different amount of money, and when the Scrivener is done with that, he gets another contract and starts over and over and over. Turkey is a little older than 60. He's likely been working at this since he was 15. That means for 45 years or more, he's gone into some office and copied documents, much like he does in the story. How do you think Turkey is managing all this? Well, the story tells us. The narrator sees the signs, but he doesn't understand them. Turkey certainly can't afford to retire. The story tells us that his money goes to, quote, red ink, which means that he's perpetually in debt, likely to shop owners. Nor can he afford to work only in the mornings. So despite his age, he'll need to work continually until likely he dies. Here's the section where we see Turkey's coping strategy. In the passage that follows, see if you can figure out how exactly Turkey's managing his unending, tedious work duties. Turkey was a short, pursy Englishman of about my own age, that is, somewhere not far from sixty. In the morning, one might say his face was of a fine, florid hue, but after twelve o'clock meridian, his dinner hour, it blazed like a grate full of Christmas coals, and continued blazing, but, as it were, with a gradual wane, till six o'clock p.m. or thereabouts after which I saw no more of the proprietor of the face, which, gaining its meridian with the sun, seemed to set with it to rise, culminate, and decline the following day, with the like regularity and undiminished glory. There are many singular coincidences I have known in the course of my life, not the least among which was the fact that exactly when Turkey displayed his fullest beams from his red and radiant countenance, just then, too, at that critical moment, began the daily period when I considered his business capacities as seriously disturbed for the remainder of the twenty-four hours. Not that he was absolutely idle or averse to business then, far from it. The difficulty was he was apt to be altogether too energetic. There was a strange, inflamed, flurried, flighty recklessness of activity about him. He would be incautious in dipping his pen into his inkstand. All his blots upon my documents were dropped there after twelve o'clock meridian. Indeed, not only would he be reckless and sadly given to making blots in the afternoon, but some days he went further and was rather noisy. At such times, too, his face flamed with augmented blazonry, as if cannel coal had been heaped on anthracite. He made an unpleasant racket with his chair, spilled his sandbox, in mending his pens, impatiently split them all to pieces, and threw them on the floor in a sudden passion, stood up and leaned over his table, boxing his papers about in a most indecorous manner, very sad to behold in an elderly man like him. Nevertheless, as he was in many ways a most valuable person to me, and all the time before twelve o'clock meridian was the quickest, steadiest creature too, accomplishing a great deal of work in a style not easy to be matched, for these reasons I was willing to overlook his eccentricities, though indeed, occasionally, I remonstrated with him. I did this very gently, however, because, though the civilest, nay, the blandest and most reverential of men in the morning, yet in the afternoon he was disposed, upon provocation, 
to be slightly rash with his tongue, in fact insolent. Now, valuing his morning services as I did, and resolved not to lose them, yet at the same time made uncomfortable by his inflamed ways after twelve o'clock, and being a man of peace, unwilling by my admonitions to call forth unseemly retorts from him, I took upon me one Saturday noon, he was always worse on Saturdays, to hint to him very kindly that, perhaps now that he was growing old, it might be well to abridge his labors. In short, he need not come to my chambers after twelve o'clock, but, dinner over, had best go home to his lodgings and rest himself till tea-time. But no, he insisted upon his afternoon devotions. His countenance became intolerably fervid, as he oratorically assured me, gesticulating with a long ruler at the other end of the room, that if his services in the morning were useful, how indispensable then in the afternoon. "'With submission, sir,' said Turkey, on this occasion, "'I consider myself your right-hand man. In the morning I but marshal and deploy my columns, but in the afternoon I put myself at their head, and gallantly charge the foe thus.' And he made a violent thrust with the ruler. "'But the blots, Turkey,' intimated I. "'True, but with submission, sir, behold these hairs.' I am getting old. Surely, sir, a blot or two of a warm afternoon is not to be severely urged against gray hairs. Old age, even if it blot the page, is honorable. With submission, sir, we both are getting old. This appeal to my fellow feeling was hardly to be resisted. At all events I saw that go he would not. So I made up my mind to let him stay, resolving nevertheless to see to it that during the afternoon he had to do with my less important papers. And so what's going on here? Well, our narrator, the lawyer, is able to see into the lives of people who are like himself, but he's having difficulty understanding the lives of those who come from different backgrounds. Clearly, Turkey is self-medicated by getting drunk every day at noon. He's done his best work in the morning, but at lunch he goes out and gets blasted before he returns to copy another round of real estate contracts over and over. Our narrator sees the signs, but doesn't see through them to their cause. Moreover, Turkey doesn't seem to be the only one getting drunk on a regular basis. He seems to have had a conversation with the other Scrivener, Nippers. Nippers, the lawyer notices, is sluggish in the morning, but is more alive in the afternoon. And what was the conversation that the two of them had? Only the lawyer wasn't there to see it? Well, it seems to be something like this. Turkey must have said, okay, Nippers, you're a young guy. You like to go out with your friends at night and you go out and drink and do whatever you want. And in the morning, if you aren't 100%, I will cover for you. But in return, Nippers, I'm an old guy. I can't take this copy in that much longer. I'm going to make it until noon and I'm going to go out and get blasted at lunch and come back and just sit at my desk and do my best dripping ink and maybe a miscopy in a word here or there and if there's anything difficult to do in the afternoon you cover for me and that's how together we're going to get through this but beyond this turkey the younger scrivener would like to increase his income he's unable to start his own official business he's unable to go to school but he's worked in a law office long enough to generally understand how the language of law works in contracts. So he has this little outside hustle where he tries to sell discounted legal services to people in the tenement neighborhoods where he lives. Occasionally, they come by the office. I always deemed him the victim of two evil powers, ambition and indigestion. The ambition was evinced by a certain impatience of the duties of a mere copyist, an unwarrantable usurpation of strictly professional affairs, such as the original drawing up of legal documents. At another point, a lawyer tells us about some of the so-called clients that come by the office for Nipper's original legal documents. These clients appear to be individuals with lower levels of income who are interested in Nipper's help in distancing themselves from debt collectors. The lawyer refers to one of them as a dun, which is simply an antiquated term for someone who is in substantial debt. And this brings us up to one of the story's larger themes. Melville wants to explore if New York has, that's New York that his contemporary readers would have known, 
if New York has engaged in a system of workplace exploitation. So what do I mean here by workplace exploitation? Workplace exploitation, in this case, defines a situation in which employers benefit far more than employees and creates a business structure in which employees are unable to meaningfully get ahead. So should the lawyer make more than his scriveners? I think that most anyone, except say for a strict Marxist, would say yes. The lawyer owns the business. He has training, he has financial risk in the venture. All of those things together should, in a capitalist system, equate to a larger reward. The question now is, how much larger? The lawyer has a nice house, good food to eat, fine clothes, and job security, while the people who work for him rent small houses, can't afford good clothes, and are often in debt. Remember that line about red ink? Red ink in ledger books defines debt. We've already outlined how the system in the 1840s has significant barriers for workers without family money to get ahead. In this environment, Melville is suggesting that there is institutional workplace exploitation shaping America's business world. For example, how many workers making low wages does it take for one business owner to have a good life? Well, in this office, it takes three or maybe four, if you count ginger nut, for the lawyer to have a comfortable life. Moreover, if you're in a pre-mechanized world, business owners need those low-wage workers to perform manual or low-skill tasks to support their business. In this, the owners are incentivized in keeping workers like the Scriveners in low-wage positions as they are necessary for the enterprise to move forward. Melville's argument here is that the image of America is a myth. Immigrants are most likely destined for the city far from open spaces and are also destined for low-wage labor from which they have little expectation of finding a better life. This system can move forward so long as everyone, or most everyone, accepts its principles. The lawyer can tell himself that he's a good person and he should be able to make substantially more than the Scriveners because he has training and has made an investment. And the Scriveners, they can tell themselves that they should earn so little because of their lack of training. These responses all require that no one questions the underlying system in which family wealth and not personal merit or long-standing work is the primary, if not sole, factor that leads a person to a comfortable life. Into this world comes Bartleby, a character with signs of depression, a character who has at least had one other low-paying job, a character who quietly is about to question the ethics of this business arrangement in which low-wage workers, like him, are unable to move ahead and can only work to enrich the people lucky enough to have been born into money and to own the businesses. At first, at the lawyer's office, Bartleby starts out as a model employee. He has skills, ambition, and drive. But once he sees that his work serves primarily to benefit his employer and the larger business system, and not himself, it's as though he no longer wants to participate in a system that demeans him and offers him no real opportunity. At first, Bartleby did an extraordinary quantity of writing. As if long famishing for something to copy, he seemed to gorge himself on my documents. There was no pause for digestion. He ran a day and night line, copying by sunlight and by candlelight. I should have been quite delighted with his application, had he been cheerfully industrious. But he wrote on silently, palely, mechanically. It is, of course, an indispensable part of a Scrivener's business to verify the accuracy of his copy word by word. Where there are two or more Scriveners in an office, they assist each other in this examination, one reading from the copy, the other holding the original. It is a very dull, wearisome, and lethargic affair. I can readily imagine that to some sanguine temperaments it would be altogether intolerable. For example, I cannot credit that the meddlesome poet Byron would have contentedly sat down with Bartleby to examine a law document of, say, five hundred pages, closely written in a crimpy hand. Now and then, in the haste of business, it had been my habit to assist in comparing some brief document myself, calling turkey or nippers for this purpose. One object I had in placing Bartleby so handy to me behind the screen 
was to avail myself of his services on such trivial occasions. It was on the third day, I think, of his being with me, and before any necessity had arisen for having his own writing examined, that, being much hurried to complete a small affair I had in hand, I abruptly called to Bartleby. In my haste and natural expectancy of instant compliance, I sat with my head bent over the original on my desk, and my right hand sideways, and somewhat nervously extended with the copy, so that immediately upon emerging from his retreat, Bartleby might snatch it and proceed to business without the least delay. In this very attitude did I sit when I called to him, rapidly stating what it was I wanted him to do, namely to examine a small paper with me. Imagine my surprise, nay, my consternation, when, without moving from his privacy, Bartleby, in a singularly mild, firm voice, replied, I would prefer not to. I sat a while in perfect silence, rallying my stunned faculties. Immediately it occurred to me that my ears had deceived me, or Bartleby had entirely misunderstood my meaning. I repeated my request in the clearest tone I could assume but in quite as clear a one came the previous reply. I would prefer not to. "'Prefer not to?' echoed I, rising in high excitement and crossing the room with a stride. "'What do you mean? Are you moonstruck? I want you to help me compare this sheet here. Take it.' And I thrust it towards him. "'I would prefer not to,' said he. I looked at him steadfastly. His face was leanly composed, his gray eye dimly calm. Not a wrinkle of agitation rippled him. Had there been the least uneasiness, anger, impatience, or impertinence in his manner, in other words, had there been anything ordinarily human about him, doubtless I should have violently dismissed him from the premises. But as it was, I should have as soon thought of turning my pale plaster of Paris bust of Cicero out of doors. I stood gazing at him a while, as he went on with his own writing, and then reseated myself at my desk. This is very strange, thought I. What had one best do? But my business hurried me. I concluded to forget the matter for the present, reserving it for my future leisure. This creates an ideal storm in the lawyer's office, leading to a breaking point. Bartleby only needs to look around the office, at Turkey and at Nippers, to understand that this job leads to a type of misery. Despite his hard work, Turkey will always remain in debt. Despite his ambitions, Nippers will never have real clients. The lawyer who doesn't like conflict is unlikely to discipline Bartleby, especially since Bartleby is so polite in his request. He is, after all, merely putting forth his preference. He'd prefer not to do that work, which is different from him saying that he won't do it, even though the outcome is pretty much the same. But in this, for an office so accustomed to the business structures of the 1840s, Bartleby is the disruptor. He is in effect saying that he believes there is something wrong with this business system, and therefore he refuses to engage it. In fact, there may be many things wrong with it. Even though the lawyer is the financial benefactor of the system, he too must feel a lower level of satisfaction in office life compared to someone who lived, say, a hundred years earlier in America. A century earlier, people worked largely outdoors on a variety of tasks. A farmer, for example, planted crops, cared for livestock, built fences, harvested crops, and then took the harvest in part to the market. The farmer's life was filled with a variety of tasks and skills. Also, he saw complex jobs through from the beginning to the end, which must have added a higher level of fulfillment. From the mid-1700s in rural America to the mid-1800s in urban America, jobs moved toward heightened specialization. What do the Scriveners do? They do one task over and over, copy contracts. But the lawyer's life, despite his income, must be dull as well. Though he doesn't copy the contracts, he writes a series of contracts that vary little from one to the next. Mr. Jones will sell Mr. Smith this property, then later Mr. Johnson will sell Mr. Miller that property, and so on. Bartleby is the disruptive force that invites the lawyer to look at the entire system. And the lawyer appears to be intrigued. No one likely has questioned the system for him before. 
In part, this causes the lawyer to take an interest in Bartleby, the new employee, in a way that he's never taken an interest in the other Scriveners, like Nippers or Turkey. But in part, the lawyer is also driven by his sense of religious morality. He's lived under a system with two masters. The system of capitalism allows him to oversee a small business and profit, and the system of New Testament Christianity directs him to help others, and in return, he can believe that he is a good neighbor to them. At one point, the lawyer takes Bartleby out and explains that if Bartleby so wants, the lawyer will help him find work in another industry. Here's the offer the lawyer makes with a number of different jobs. But as you hear the list again now, how many of these jobs seem appealing to you? Now, what sort of business would you like to engage in? Would you like to re-engage in copying for someone? No, I would prefer not to make any change. Would you like a clerkship in a dry goods store? There is too much confinement about that. No, I would not like a clerkship, but I am not particular. Too much confinement, I cried. Why, you keep yourself confined all the time. I would prefer not to take a clerkship, he rejoined, as if to settle that little item at once. How would a bartender's business suit you? There is no trying of the eyesight in that. I would not like it at all, though, as I said before, I am not particular. His unwanted wordiness inspirited me. I returned to the charge. Well, then, would you like to travel through the country collecting bills for the merchants? That would improve your health. No, I would prefer to be doing something else. How, then, would going as a companion to Europe to entertain some young gentleman with your conversation? How would that suit you? Not at all. It does not strike me that there is anything definite about that. I like to be stationary, but I am not particular. Stationary you shall be, then, I cried, now losing all patience, and for the first time in all my exasperating connection with him fairly flying into a passion. If you do not go away from these premises before night, I shall feel bound, indeed I am bound, to, to, to quit the premises myself. And so what jobs do we have here? These are all entry-level jobs that offer no reasonable hope of advancement. The lawyer says that Bartleby can be a copyist or a clerk in a dry goods store. This, essentially, is the cashier. So Bartleby can be a worker in a store, but never its manager and, of course, never its owner. He could have a job in the service industry, such as a bartender, but, of course, not bar manager or owner of the pub, or he could be a traveling bill collector. There's one job on this list that does sound somewhat appealing. Quote, a companion to Europe to entertain some young gentleman with your conversation. That is, it sounds good until you realize what is being suggested. The lawyer is suggesting that Bartleby can be a valet. That's a traveling butler. It's as though the lawyer is saying, Bartleby, you can arrange travel, carry luggage, set out clothes for some wealthy man on a trip. You will not be seeing interesting sights yourself. You'll be managing his hotel room and making sure that the drinks are ready when this young man returns from his day's venture. But you'll hear about those interesting sights through conversation when the young man talks about them in the evening. By his reaction. Bartleby seems to, at this point in his life, understand that the American dream of advancement in the 1840s is mostly a myth. It's a way to entice low-level workers into focusing on labor that will enrich business owners. Also, the lower wages, at least for people with families, will lead them into debt, which means that they are unable to leave their low-wage positions. Bartleby here is doing something unique. Everyone else in the story accepts this labor arrangement as a natural way of life. It's likely the only business system that any of them have ever known. Because of that, it feels deeply familiar and, by extension, must have the sheen of an arrangement that almost belongs to the natural world. In general, it's rare for individuals to question a system that they have lived inside of their entire lives. As a side note here, 
I'd like to say that this is one of the best reasons, at some point in your college career, that you should go on a study abroad program for at least one term, if not longer. Because that space, when you are geographically removed from home, allows you to question and critique many systems that feel natural to you in your home country. But in this story, Bartleby has been able to lift himself through his personal experience and some level of quiet analysis to a place where he can see that the American labor system isn't tied to nature or even a sense of merit. It's a constructed system specifically designed to benefit some people and deprivilege others. In other words, it's a system that enriches a few and makes many others poor and dependent. By degrees, during the final third of the story, the lawyer slowly becomes aware that the misery of Bartleby is a byproduct of the business system that has also made him comfortable. At this point, the lawyer has three problems. One, Bartleby might be an example that his other two Scriveners could follow, leading them to do no work with minimal consequences. Two, Bartleby, by not working, damages the image of the office when clients visit. And three, though the narrator doesn't or perhaps is unable to admit this, Bartleby might also provoke him at this point into a type of guilt, as Bartleby is a personal reminder of the deep inequities in business society from which the lawyer has benefited. Somewhere over these days, the lawyer, again by degrees, softly at first, begins to understand that the two systems that govern his life might not fully mesh together. For years, the lawyer has believed that the American system of capitalism in the 1840s has matched perfectly with his New Testament morality. But through Bartleby, the lawyer can see that this type of American capitalism is not always helping his neighbor, but actually, at times, is damaging them. Because the lawyer is so conflict avoidant, he follows through on his threat to move his office and leave Bartleby behind. That, surprisingly, is the path of least resistance. From there, Bartleby is arrested not for any violent or malicious crime, but simply because he continues to loiter around the building where the lawyer once worked. Bartleby is taken to the tomes, that is, the jail, where the lawyer visits him. Motivation in people is often complicated, as it is here. The lawyer, I think, is partially driven to help Bartleby, even at this point, because of a desire to fulfill New Testament teachings. But he's also likely driven by a sense of guilt, as he has benefited from the system that has damaged Bartleby, and also a desire to atone for having participated in that system. Remember, our narrator can only narrate those observations of which he's aware. As you listen to this final section of the story, try to arrive at some personal understanding at how deeply this experience with Bartleby, including his death, will affect the lawyer as he moves forward with his life. The same day I received the note I went to the tombs, or to speak more properly, the halls of justice. Seeking the right officer, I stated the purpose of my call, and was informed that the individual I described was indeed within. I then assured the functionary that Bartleby was a perfectly honest man, and greatly to be compassionated, however unaccountably eccentric. I narrated all I knew, and closed by suggesting the idea of letting him remain in as indulgent confinement as possible, till something less harsh might be done, though indeed I hardly knew what. At all events, if nothing else could be decided upon, the almshouse must receive him. I then begged to have an interview. Being under no disgraceful charge, and quite serene and harmless in all his ways, they had permitted him freely to wander about the prison and especially in the enclosed, grass-platted yard thereof. And so I found him there, standing all alone in the quietest of the yards, his face towards a high wall, while all around, from the narrow slits of the jail windows, I thought I saw peering out upon him the eyes of murderers and thieves. "'Bartleby!' "'I know you,' he said, without looking round, "'and I want nothing to say to you. 
"'It was not I that brought you here, Bartleby,' said I, keenly pained at his implied suspicion. "'And to you this should not be so vile a place. Nothing reproachful attaches to you by being here. And see, it is not so sad a place as one might think. Look, there is the sky, and here is the grass.' "'I know where I am,' he replied, but would say nothing more, and so I left him. As I entered the corridor again, a broad, meat-like man, in an apron, accosted me, and jerking his thumb over his shoulder, said, "'Is that your friend?' "'Yes. Does he want to starve? If he does, let him live on the prison fare. That's all.' "'Who are you?' asked I, not knowing what to make of such an unofficially speaking person in such a place. I am the grub man. Such gentlemen as have friends here hire me to provide them with something good to eat. Is this so? said I, turning to the turnkey. He said it was. Well then, said I, slipping some silver into the grub man's hands, for so they called him, I want you to give particular attention to my friend there. Let him have the best dinner you can get, and you must be as polite to him as possible. Introduce me, will you? said the grub man looking at me with an expression which seemed to say he was all impatience for an opportunity to give a specimen of his breeding. Thinking it would prove of benefit to the Scrivener, I acquiesced, and asking the grub man his name, went up with him to Bartleby. Bartleby, this is Mr. Cutlets. You will find him very useful to you. Your servant, sir, your servant, said the grub man, making a low salutation behind his apron. Hope you find it pleasant here, sir. Spacious grounds, cool apartments, sir. Hope you'll stay with us some time. Try to make it agreeable. May Mrs. Cutlets and I have the pleasure of your company to dinner, sir, in Mrs. Cutlets's private room? I prefer not to dine today, said Bartleby, turning away. It would disagree with me. I am unused to dinners. So saying, he slowly moved to the other side of the enclosure, and took up a position fronting the dead wall. "'How's this?' said the grub man, addressing me with a stare of astonishment. "'He's odd, ain't he?' "'I think he is a little deranged,' said I, sadly. "'Deranged? Deranged, is it? Well, now, upon my word, I thought that friend of yourn was a gentleman forger. They are always pale and genteel like them forgers. I can't pity him. Can't help it, sir. Did you know Monroe Edwards?' he added touchingly and paused. Then, laying his hand pityingly on my shoulder, sighed, he died of consumption at Sing Sing. So you weren't acquainted with Monroe? No, I was never socially acquainted with any forgers. But I cannot stop longer. Look to my friend yonder. You will not lose by it. I will see you again. Some few days after this, I again obtained admission to the tombs, and went through the corridors in quest of Bartleby, but without finding him. I saw him coming from his cell not long ago, said a turnkey. Maybe he's gone to loiter in the yards. So I went in that direction. "'Are you looking for the silent man?' said another turnkey, passing me. "'Yonder he lies, sleeping in the yard there. "'Tis not twenty minutes since I saw him lie down.' The yard was entirely quiet. It was not accessible to the common prisoners. The surrounding walls, of amazing thickness, kept off all sounds behind them. The Egyptian character of the masonry weighed upon me with its gloom but a soft, imprisoned turf grew underfoot. The heart of the eternal pyramids, it seemed, wherein, by some strange magic, through the clefts, grass-seed, dropped by birds, had sprung. Strangely huddled at the base of the wall, his knees drawn up, and lying on his side, his head touching the cold stones, I saw the wasted Bartleby, but nothing stirred. I paused, then went close up to him, stooped over, and saw that his dim eyes were open. Otherwise he seemed profoundly sleeping. Something prompted me to touch him. I felt his hand when a tingling shiver ran up my arm and down my spine to my feet. The round face of the grub man peered upon me now. His dinner is ready. Won't he dine today, either? Or does he live without dining? Lives without dining, said I, and closed his eyes. Eh? He's asleep, ain't he? With kings and counselors, murmured I. There would seem little need for proceeding further in this history. Imagination will readily supply the meager recital of poor Bartleby's interment. 
But ere parting with the reader, let me say, that if this little narrative has sufficiently interested him, to awaken curiosity as to who Bartleby was, and what manner of life he led prior to the present narrator's making his acquaintance, I can only reply, that in such curiosity I fully share, but am wholly unable to gratify it. Yet here I hardly know whether I should divulge one little item of rumor, which came to my ear a few months after the Scrivener's decease. Upon what basis it rested, I could never ascertain, and hence, how true it is, I cannot now tell. But inasmuch as this vague report has not been without certain strange suggestive interest to me, however sad, it may prove the same with some others, and so I will briefly mention it. The report was this, that Bartleby had been a subordinate clerk in the dead-letter office at Washington, from which he had been suddenly removed by a change in the administration. When I think over this rumor, I cannot adequately express the emotions which seize me. Dead letters! Does it not sound like dead men? Conceive a man by nature and misfortune prone to a pallid hopelessness. Can any business seem more fitted to heighten it than that of continually handling these dead letters, and assorting them for the flames? For by the cartload they are annually burned. Sometimes from out the folded paper the pale clerk takes a ring. The finger it was meant for, perhaps, moulders in the grave. A banknote sent in swiftest charity. He whom it would relieve, nor eats nor hungers any more. Pardon for those who died despairing. Hope for those who died unhoping. Good tidings for those who died stifled by unrelieved calamities. On errands of life these letters speed to death. Ah, Bartleby! Ah, humanity! At the end of this story, Bartleby appears to take control of the situation in the only way left to him. He refuses to engage a system by killing himself through starvation. This is not a political act. There is no note, no explanation of why he refuses to eat. It's an act wholly of self-control, in which Bartleby refuses to participate in a system that will never benefit him, despite the work he puts into it. Even though it's not a political act, the lawyer now has enough information to assemble Bartleby's motivation. By the end of the story, the lawyer has clearly arrived at a moment where he can see that systems of humanity have produced the damage and death of Bartleby. Ah, humanity, ah, Bartleby. The lawyer equates them together as though one causes the other. It's as though the lawyer is saying, ah, how sad it is that systems of humanity have been arranged in this way, and ah, how sad it is that Bartleby, with his sensitive nature, was injured by them to the point where he became despondent, stopped eating, and died. Some stories have hard closure, in which all of the final elements are depicted in drama, while other stories have soft closure, in which the final elements play out in the reader's mind. This is an example of soft closure allowing readers, based on their understanding of the previous events, to imagine how the lawyer will react in the coming days. Do you think that the lawyer, now that he better understands the business system of his day, will return to his office and give Turkey a raise and promise to help Nippers understand law so that someday Nippers can have real clients of his own? Or do you think that the lawyer will decide that of those two systems, religion and capitalism, that capitalism will be the stronger voice in his head, so that when he returns to his office, he will move forward, as he always has, letting the system determine the going rate for Scrivener's work and keeping the practices the same in that office, though the cost of this will be his religious conscience, quietly grinding away at his soul with small amounts of guilt. These are the two possibilities at the end. Which do you think is the more likely outcome? The story never answers that question, but instead allows you, the reader, to fill in the ultimate conclusion that best fits your understanding of the drama that leads up to this moment. In this, we have, ultimately, a story that moves away from some core elements of Romanticism. We have a contemporary American setting. We're in the city rather than in nature. We also have some characters, such as the lawyer, Turkey, and Nippers, 
who represent average individuals from the 1840s. But in other aspects, this story embraces many core elements of Romanticism. Bartleby is still a non-centrist character. He's highly sensitive, he's an outlier, somewhat of a loner, and has a unique ability to understand society. He's a romantic character. Likewise, the plot is a non-centrist, unusual story, the story of a person who starves himself to death so as to end his participation in a system that doesn't benefit him. This is a romantic plot, a plot that doesn't happen to most people. This, then, is a transitional story that moves us from one aesthetic that dominates the first half of the 19th century in America toward another aesthetic that will dominate the second half of that same century. But that topic is one we will more fully explore in our next lecture.